All right, we're back. Episode two, season two, and it's Tuesday. Dang, two, 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 angel number. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, we're doing something a little different with this episode. Um, we don't have an interview. We, I mean, there's news to report on and things that are happening that we could talk about, obviously. But um, for this season, I kind of wanted to introduce something a little different. Um, a little story time, if you will. Um, like a story time segment where I can sit here and tell you guys about some of the biggest moments or the most important moments in sport law history and what you know has happened in shaping the world of sports that we know today. And one of the things that I wanted to start out with is, of course, the NCAA and how we got to where we are today. So this is kind of like a history lesson, kind of like a story time, kind of like a, yeah, like a little story time thing. So I hope you guys enjoy it. I hope it's entertaining. Um, and I hope it makes sense, too, because this <laughs> this was, um, I'll be honest with you, <laughs> I'm literally reading my um, undergrad research um, paper that I did for my closing seminar for LES here at UIS. It's a book. Nah, it's 13 pages. 13 pages without the citations and without the title, the title page. But, um, yeah, I, I mean, when I did it, I got a, a pretty decent grade on it, I think. I mean, I graduated. <laughs> um, you graduated? Yeah, I, I did. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I think that's really it. So... Without further ado, I guess, hope you guys enjoy this. This is how the NCAA weaponized amateurism in a failed attempt at obtaining an antitrust exemption. Enjoy. In 1995, the first executive director of the National Collegiate Athletic Association, Walter Byers, wrote a memoir that unapologetically tore down the very association he commercialized. Byers' book on sportsmanlike conduct was an apology letter for leading an organization that abused the term amateurism. In 1994, a year prior to the publication of his book, Byers spoke at the Kansas City Sports Commission's annual gala dinner where he was being awarded for his contributions to amateur sports. Byer let his voracious feelings about amateurism be known. Each generation of young persons come along and all they ask is, Coach, give me a chance. I can do it. And it's a disservice to these young people that the management of intercollegiate athletics stays in place, committed to an outmoded code of amateurism. And I attribute that to, quite frankly, the neo-plantation mentality that exists on campuses of our country and in the conference offices and in the NCAA. The coach owns the athlete's foot, the college owns the athlete's body, and the athlete's mind is supposed to comprehend a rule book that I challenge Dave Burst, who's sitting in, down in this audience, to explain in rational terms to you inside of eight hours. Now, the former NCAA executive that once vehemently defended amateurism now stood before a room of his adversaries that scowl and faintly applaud for the sake of decorum after he was just awarded for contributions to the very idea that allows the NCAA to profit off the backs of amateur athletes. Here, Byers explains the issue with the NCAA's abuse of the term amateurism for commercial gain. The term amateurism empowers the NCAA to argue that it should have complete control over the lives of student-athletes who should have no other motivation to play their sport other than for the love of their sport. According to a book written by Alan Sack and Ellen Starowski, the NCAA first adopted this term in 1916. Article 6B of the original NCAA handbook which first defined an amateur as one who participates in competitive physical sports only for the pleasure and the physical, mental, moral, and social benefits derived therefrom. In 1922, this, de this definition later included, and to whom the sport is nothing more than an avocation, i.e. a hobby. Amateurism has been the justification given for why student athletes are subjected to dedicating hours of their days and weeks to something that resembles more a full-time employment job rather than an extracurricular, understanding that room, board, and tuition often depend on the student's obedience to the NCAA's orders. 
the reality of how the term amateurism is used has strayed away from the original idea of the term. Switching over time from protecting the competition and sanctity of certain athletic organizations like the NCAA, the Olympics, and USA Boxing, to now being a term utilized by the NCAA to create a profitable business model. The NCAA has attempted to argue that it should not be subject to antitrust law, but in fact, evidence suggests that it operates quite like a monopoly. Walter Byers' scintillating expose on the NCAA reveals how the association can have this nearly unregulated control over the lives of student-athletes when he writes, those who control the marketplace are the same as those who define the terms and thus preordain the results. This is the philosophy of the NCAA that leads their executives to believe that they are above the law. In this quote, Byers describes the very principles of a monopoly and explains how the NCAA acts in a manner that assumes it has full control and can asphyxiate the collegiate sport market. In recent years, the NCAA has argued that student athletes should not receive compensation outside of athletic grants and aid. This argument has spilled over into the NCAA's antitrust exemption arguments, with proponents of the NCAA receiving an exemption arguing that the association has a crucial role in promoting amateurism and preserving competitive balance in collegiate sports. Now, previous scholarship has argued that the NCAA is a functioning business organization that profits mainly off the back of student-athletes. And after gathering information from studies done on the NCAA, as well as understanding the outcomes on a majority of the antitrust violation suits brought against the NCAA, research has found that the consensus is that, yes, the NCAA is a commercial business that profits off the backs of these student-athletes. While scholars may disagree on possible solutions such as classifying student-athletes as employees and allowing them to collectively bargain, the understanding of the NCAA no longer being just the regulating body for collegiate athletics remains. It is well understood that the NCAA's business model is cartel-like in the way that it believes that it should have control over every aspect and the monetization of athletic programs. Academic scholars who are proponents of the antitrust exemption for the NCAA, who are not the NCAA themselves, have repeated this argument that the distraction of antitrust litigation makes it hard for the NCAA to effectively govern and protect fairness in college sports, while still conceding that the collegiate sport is a yearly growing commercial market. Now, this research takes a different approach by first dismissing the notion that antitrust exemption for the NCAA is about protecting amateurism. The vehement opposition the association has to antitrust suits being brought against them, coupled with their opinion on not needing to pay student-athletes to protect the sanctity of amateurism, reveals that the NCAA has a bottom line to protect. A bottom line that is purely financially motivated and that does not account for protecting their student-athletes. Now, I tried to deviate my research from previous research by analyzing the reasonings for an antitrust exemption and then deriving the underlying reason the NCAA calls for an exemption to antitrust law. Despite the NCAA's claim that the need to protect amateurism justifies its exemption from antitrust regulations, this research will suggest that monetary benefits should be understood as the underlying reason behind the NCAA's position. The NCAA's exploitation of student-athletes is the focal point of this issue. Student athletes are used by their nonprofit institutions like employees to increase yearly financial returns, yet they do not have fair compensation nor proper employee protections. Now, I think this research perspective matters because many believe that student athletes for far too long have been used like employees to make millions for coaches, school athletic program directors, and NCAA executives who advocate for protecting amateurism, but never the actual person a student athlete is. An exemption from antitrust law allows the NCAA to take advantage of a market that has a rapidly growing commercial value and that only they have a say in regarding to the rules and regulation on monetization. And with the NCAA being the only actors in the monetization of collegiate athletics, they have an interest in and will blatantly attempt to protect their profit margins by limiting the financial value of athletics to only be realized by the association, conferences, and their school members. This issue of the NCAA being a profit-focused organization has been recognized for decades, actually more like nearly 100 years. In 1926, the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching was asked to conduct a study on collegiate athletics, which was published in early 1929. The writers for the Carnegie Foundation bring forward many of the same criticisms of the NCAA discussed in more contemporary conversations, 
such as the lack of student involvement in decision making and the abandonment of amateurism. In that study, the president of the Carnegie Foundation, Henry S. Pritchett, provides a preface that addresses the issue of college football being an unrecognized commercial product that is profitable. He writes that college football is a highly organized commercial enterprise. The athletes who take part in it have come up through years of training. They are commanded by professional coaches. Little, if any, personal initiative of ordinary play is left to the player. The great matches are highly profitable enterprises. Pritchett addresses the growing commercialization of college athletics and its relation to the educational and social aspects of higher education. The study by the Carnegie Foundation was successful in finding that these schools were generating profits students never saw unless the money was properly laundered by the institution itself and then granted to the student in the form of grants and aid or scholarships. Pritchett notes that while student athletes receive athletic grants and aid, they are doing so while also being asked to deal with the growing publicity and must give up an amount of time not conducive to fostering strong scholarship. These resonances echo 95 years later. Curiously, there is no mention of the terms antitrust nor monopoly as it relates to the business of the NCAA. But the Sherman Act was passed only 30 years prior to the publication of the study. So recognizing its application to collegiate sports would take some time. 55 years to be exact. This document ultimately shows that in 1929, it was already recognized that college athletic institutions were fostering profitable programs before promoting the scholarly success of student athletes by restricting their ability to freely bargain and negotiate what ends up being a pseudo-employment contract. Unlike 1929, we now have the understanding to apply antitrust law to a realm like collegiate sports, understanding that the market it operates within. However, it took until 1984 to apply the law that protect our markets from antitrust violations to collegiate athletics. While not entirely pertinent to the discussion of revenue sharing with exploited student athletes, the 1984 Supreme Court case, National Collegiate Athletic Association versus Board of Regents of the University of Oklahoma, was the first time the NCAA had to answer for their primarily profit-driven practices and did so by claiming to be nothing more than a defender of amateurism. The University of Oklahoma and the University of Georgia sued the association, challenging the NCAA's television plan for college football games for the 1981 to 1985 seasons as antitrust violations. Prior to the 81 season, the NCAA was in the process of negotiating television deals with ABC and CBS to broadcast 14 live games per season. The deal also included a clause in which either network can enter individual negotiations with the competing schools they will be featuring on their network. The programs also agreed to pay a minimum aggregate compensation to schools who were members of the NCAA at the time, which was negotiated by the NCAA. The NCAA then had to ensure the broadcasting networks had those checks meant something, and the NCAA did this by ensuring the networks that member schools would not have the power to negotiate outside of these contractual guidelines. The University of Oklahoma and the University of Georgia believe that the NCAA, without their consent commanding that their member schools not freely negotiate and freely bargain, was a violation of their right to freely negotiate and freely bargain. The Board of Regents majority ruling, as described by the NCAA's former executive director, Walter Byers, found the college working through the NCAA to control the television rights clearly crosses the line from not-for-profit educational activities into the business world. The NCAA's limitations on the output of televised games amounted to restraint of trade, as well as other violations of federal antitrust statutes. The majority ruling of the court utilized the rule of reason analysis to determine whether the NCAA's contract with ABC and CBS restricted commerce. The court analyzed this case using the rule of reason over the per se rule of antitrust analysis because the case is about an agreement in which some elements of restriction of trade can be deemed necessary. Writing, rather, what is critical is that this case involves an industry in which horizontal restraints on competition are essential if the product is to be available at all. So the court felt that it was necessary to weigh the positive and negative effects of the contract and its elements that restrict trade versus determining whether the agreement violates antitrust without weighing those outcomes. This is because the court reasoned that the NCAA, in primarily being the regulating body of collegiate athletics, 
could have an argument for the legality of their contract if the restrictive elements of the contract had more positive effects to the preservation and encouragement of intercollegiate amateur athletics rather than negative effects to the commerce and trade. Due to this argument's success in shifting antitrust analysis from per se rule to the rule of reason, this argument has remained a key talking point for the association in its continued legal battles against antitrust law enforcement. As the case moved from the district court to the Supreme Court, the argument shifted from simply preserving amateurism to preserving the competitive balance amongst amateur athletics as being enough reason for broadcasting limitations. This is because, as a lead attorney representing the NCAA, Frank Easterbrook argued before the Supreme Court, we think amateurism is very relevant in this market for the following sense. A group of amateur and educational nonprofit schools and the NCAA may very well undertake certain practices which deliberately fail to maximize its profits. The amateur and athletic status of the NCAA may be very important in understanding why the NCAA would intentionally do something other than maximize profits. Here, Easterbrook reasons that the amateurism has relevance in this market because antitrust law does not necessitate that everyone has to maximize profits. Rather, the law is in place to prevent someone from maximizing their profits by monopolizing, which is why he prefaces his reasoning for leaving out the defense of amateurism statuses with the idea that there might be some practices taken by the organization that deliberately fail to maximize profits. Even with the shift in utilization of the preservation of amateurism argument, the Supreme Court still found it necessary to address this point in its majority ruling. The court explained that the NCAA did not need to restrict trade and commerce abilities of their partner schools to preserve amateurism and athletic statuses of student-athletes. While the preservation of amateurism has been the NCAA's leading rationalization for an antitrust law exemption, it is also important to understand the other arguments made by the NCAA in the courtroom and some of the ones reiterated by scholars. Understanding these arguments help us to appreciate why they ought to be rejected. The NCAA's main arguments for an exemption to the regulation are that the association qualifies for an educational exemption and or the state action exemption. The rule of reason should allow for a quasi-group boycotts to have no anti-competitive motives and that the preservation of amateurism justify rules that prohibit student-athletes from receiving compensation for the use of their name, image, and likenesses, which is otherwise referred to as NIL. The first two of these being federal antitrust exemption standards, and that last being nothing more than a shot in the dark. The case Hennessy v. National Collegiate Athletic Association from the United States Court of Appeals of the Fifth Circuit is a case where the questions of the NCAA's relationship to antitrust law is directly answered. The case was regarding the NCAA bylaw that limits the number of assistant coaches which can be employed by member schools at any one time. The plaintiffs of the case claim that limiting work opportunities constitute injury to their commercial interests, which is an antitrust violation under the Clayton Act. Different from the Sherman Act, the Clayton Act has no criminal penalties, but does permit trouble damages to be awarded. In response to this claim, the NCAA, for one of the first times ever in the courtroom, made the outright claim, it is a voluntary, nonprofit organization whose activities and objectives are educational and are carried out with respect to amateur athletics, is exempt from Section 1 of the Sherman Antitrust Act. The NCAA gave two reasons why it should be exempt from antitrust regulation, education and state action. The first argument was that the NCAA is a nonprofit organization with primarily educational motives and goals and should be exempt. The court reasoned that an exclusion from antitrust application for the NCAA could not be granted because Congress intended to strike as broadly as it could in Section 1 of the Sherman Act and to read it into it so wide an exemption as that urged on us would be at odds with that purpose, meaning that the court intended to rule with the original intent and interpretation of the law which is to protect as many circumstances of commerce as the Sherman Act can reach. The second contention of the NCAA was that it qualifies for the state action exemption. The NCAA argues that because it is an association made up of state institutions, it is entitled to that exemption. The circuit court here reasons that because the governmental character of the NCAA is only a part of the state action exemption and that the NCAA fails to link the state directions and intentions of the state legislators to the passing of the NCAA bylaws, then the NCAA is not entitled to the antitrust exemptions through the state action exemption. 
So this case proves that the NCAA does not qualify for an educational exemption nor the state action exemption. The Arizona District Court case, Justice v. NCAA, was one of the main cases that asked the courts to analyze the antitrust claim using the rule of reason analysis opposed to the per se analysis. A year prior to the Board of Reagan's case, the District Court of Arizona ruled on a case that questioned whether the enforcement of the NCAA sanctions against the University of Arizona football team, which rendered them ineligible for postseason competition in 1983 and 84, and unable to make television appearances in 84 and 85, was an antitrust violation. The plaintiff argues that the sanctions imposed on the University of Arizona were violations to the Antitrust Act by restricting the university's ability to participate in the market of televised postseason collegiate football. The argument was dependent on the notion that the NCAA's infractions committee vote, which adjudicated the sanctioning, constituted an illegal group boycott by other members of schools that are in direct competition with the University of Arizona. The association's counter-arguments are that the plaintiffs failed to show any sufferings from antitrust injury. They failed to properly elucidate how the sanctions affect trade or commerce, and the rule of reason should allow for the group boycott, because the boycott itself, if it is found to be a boycott, has no anti-competitive motive. The court reasoned that the vote by the infractions committee was not a group boycott and agree that the claims of the antitrust violation against the NCAA should be analyzed, utilizing the rule of reason. The claims brought by the plaintiff were denied due to this, and this now sets precedent for the antitrust violation claims brought against the NCAA to be analyzed, utilizing the rule of reason. Even with the rule of reason, the NCAA still does not have complete immunity from antitrust regulation. This is famously shown in the O'Bannon v. NCAA case which was a landmark case from the United States Supreme Court that directly addressed whether the NCAA's rules that prohibited student-athletes from realizing compensation for use of their NILs was an antitrust violation. The plaintiff of the case argued that the NCAA's using players' NILs in advertisements and video games without compensating the student-athletes was a violation of the Sherman Act. The NCAA countered this argument with four purposes for the rules, with the court dismissing two of the justifications. One of the justifications for the compensation rules accepted by the courts are for the protection of amateurism claim. On the amateurism justification, the U.S. Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals looked to the Board of Regents to reason that the NCAA's amateurism rules serve as a pro-competitive purpose. However, the validity of the rules, if they are challenged, must be proved, not presumed. The court agrees with the NCAA that amateurism rules have pro-competitive characteristics, but the court asserts that if a rule which can be replaced with the less restrictive one that furthers the same objective of protecting amateurism and competition, then the original rule would be invalid under the rule of reason. This was a case with the compensation rules as found by the court in this case when the court initially dismissed the claim by the NCAA that the compensation rules were not subject to antitrust regulation in the first place. The compensation rules were found to regulate the terms of commercial transaction between athletic recruiters and their chosen schools. Looking past the NCAA's claim that the competition rules served as eligibility restrictions that justify the rules restrictions on pricing terms and recruiting agreements. This effectively put the amateurism argument to rest. As the NCAA now realized it cannot lean on the argument anymore to keep overly restrictive trade and commerce rules in place. Now, having analyzed the main arguments made by the association in some of their most important antitrust suits, having analyzed the main arguments made by the association in some of the most important antitrust suits, it is also important to delineate the underlying reasoning the NCAA has so vehemently fought for an exemption to antitrust regulation. Clearly, the sample size provided does not account for every case, seeing as the rule of reason analysis allows NCAA to continue to make their case for imposing restrictive rules and antitrust regulation exemptions. In fact, the NCAA's relationship with the rule of reason is analyzed in the scholarly article, the NCAA and the rule of reason, which found that the problem with the Supreme Court's mandatory rule of reason is that it is excessively structural and that it looks at the nature of the organization rather than the nature of the challenged rule. The author reasoning that the way the court has ruled in cases only looks at the importance the rule has to the lawful operation of the NCAA's joint ventures with their member universities, as was seen in O'Bannon when the court refused to apply the per se treatment to the blatant price fixing of television deals. So if the court believes that in some cases these violations lack ancillary to the NCAA's operations, then why would they not analyze them under the per se rule? 
Well, this is mainly due to the fact that it would make the operation of collegiate athletics more expensive than it already is. There needs to be a less restrictive application of antitrust law to a model like the NCAA in order to maintain affordability for smaller schools and less profitable athletic programs. This does not mean, however, that there needs to be a complete exemption from antitrust regulation. The NCAA has been seeking an exemption from enforcement of antitrust law for over 50 years now, and the NCAA's biggest setbacks in recent efforts has been NCAA versus Alston. And it wasn't even discussed in this work because precedents sent by cases like O'Bannon, Hennessy, and Board of Regents suffice in explaining how we got to Alston. Alston presents reality in which students can now realize profits from the use of their NILs. And this model that allows the NCAA to govern athletics and not govern their profits returns as heavily should be at the forefront of their operations. All right, guys, I hope you like that. Thanks for listening. Um, that was fun. Um, it took a really long time to record because I can't read. But I made it through. Um, I hope you liked it. I hope you learned something. And, you know, maybe we do something like this again. Maybe we do something with, like, you know, we focus on a specific case and I tell you the story about it or, you know, something along those lines. But, yeah. Um, tune in next week. Next week we're going to have another episode. I don't know what we're going to do, but we're going to figure it out. All right. Adios.